Hi everyone and welcome. Um, I'm Kim Boyer. I'm the um, State President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs and this webinar tonight is a joint um, effort from the University of Tasmania and the um, AIIA. So welcome. In welcoming you, I'd like to pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, albeit that some of us are meeting remotely, um, the Palawa people, and pay due respect to their elders, past, present and emerging for the steadfast way in which they've maintained their connection to their culture and land. Um, firstly, a couple of housekeeping arrangements. Um, you'll notice that all of your uh, mics are muted, as is the hands up um, signal at the bottom of your screen. But we do encourage questions and there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can type in your questions. And when we get to the end of James's talk, then I'll do my very best to ensure that um, as many of them as possible are answered, as I'm sure James will too. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome James Chin. Professor James Chin was the um, uh, recent um, director of the Australian Institute, Asian Institute in Tasmania, um, which is now subject to a restructure. But James is Professor of Political Science and Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Tasmania. He's internationally and nationally renowned as a commentator on governance um, and uh, politics in Asia but particularly in Malaysia and Singapore. AIIA has a very close relationship with James through the Asia Institute and because James is a uh, extremely competent and great speaker. So I look forward to his update on regime change in Malaysia tonight. So thanks James and welcome. A very good evening to all of you and thank you very much for making the time to come to this seminar. I'll start off by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners upon which the University of Tasmania stands, and also to thank the AIIA for inviting me uh, to speak about Malaysia this afternoon. So the first thing we need to do is to share my screen. Uh, can you guys see that? Okay. So what I'll do this afternoon is uh, essentially talk about uh, regime change in Malaysia not the 2018 regime change, but the regime change that took part in uh, February this year. I think a lot of people outside Malaysia were very surprised that suddenly there was a change in government in the last week of February. And a lot of people are wondering how did this come about? So basically what I want to do this afternoon is answer the following questions. What happened? What were the undercurrents that led to a certain change of regime in Kuala Lumpur? And I'll argue that, that there's basically three things that was pushing for regime change. Then I'll talk a bit about the new government. And of course, where do we go from here? So what happened to Malaysia? Well, essentially, I think we have to go back to 2018 when the first regime change took place. And that was a historic regime change that occurred on the 9th of May. 2018. The reason why it's really historic is because that was the first time Malaysia had a change of government after 60 years of one party rule. So the new coalition government that came into power in May 2018 called themselves Pakatan Harapan or Alliance of Hope. And that essentially consists of four major parties. The first one is a party called Parti Adilan Rakyat. Justice Party and that's led by Anwar Ibrahim. The second one is a party called the Democratic Action Party and it's led by Lim Wang Eng. The third one is Amanan Negara and that was led by Muhammad Sabu. And of course the fourth party and this is the party that's well, uh, well known throughout the world is Pribumi Besatu Malaysia. Besatu and that's led by the former Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. So basically on the 9th of May 2018, Malaysia saw its first regime change, historic after 60 years, and many people are very excited about it. I think part of the reasons why people are very excited about the regime change was that Malaysia and Singapore were traditionally seen as very stable one-party states, and they've basically been ruled by the same party that led the country to independence. 
So now with Malaysia supposedly joining the Club of Democracies in the whole of Southeast Asia, we only have Singapore left. In other words, Singapore is the only country where the ruling party is the same party that led the country to independence. As a side note, Singapore is going to hold a general election coming in July. And a lot of people are asking themselves, will Singapore go through the same experience Malaysia went through two years ago? But anyway, here we are 22 months later, the Pakatan Harapan government has collapsed. So what happened? I think to understand what happened, we need to look at the week where everything fell apart. And that crucial week was essentially the last week of February this year. So I'll start off by talking about all the major things that happened. Essentially, the thing that triggered off the collapse of the government started on a Friday night. And that was when the Pakatan Harapan, the Alliance of Hope, they held a presidential council meeting on a Friday night. Uh, the reasons why they had to call for a meeting was because there was a lot of tensions in the system. Uh, between Mahatha and Anwar. Going back to 2018, when Pakatan Harapang was first established, it was understood that if they were to win power, Mahathe will only stay for two years. And that after two years, he will transfer power over to Anwar Ibrahim. So the two years was coming up, in other words, in May 2020. So that was the reason why they pushed for that presidential council meeting. Just prior to the meeting, Mahathe announced in public that he was not going to hand power over to Anwar Ibrahim and that he will only leave power sometime around November or December this year after the APEC meeting. So what happened was that during this presidential council meeting, there were lots of arguments among the four parties. It is my understanding that there was a lot of pressure from PKR and DAP to ask Mahate to set a very firm date on when he will hand power over to Anwar. Mahate refused. So after the presidential council meeting, Basatu, which is Mahate's party, they held a separate meeting. At that meeting, it was quite clear that all the leadership of Basatu was very unhappy with what had just happened. Uh, they argued that Mahate was being bullied. And as a senior statesperson and a prime minister, uh, people do not have the right to bully him. Uh, that's essentially the position they took. Now, in terms of the decisions made at the Basatu uh, leadership meeting, uh, there's still a lot of controversy over this. Uh, what we do know is that there are two versions. Uh, the first version is uh, given by Muyadin Yasing, the number two guy in Basatu. He argues that the key decision taken at that meeting after the Pakatan Harapan presidential meeting was that Bersatu will leave Pakatan Harapan and set up a separate government. The second version is the version given by Mahate, and he argued that at that crucial meeting, the only decision that was taken was that they will let Mahate decide what to do. Lo and behold, within 24 hours, Muyading and the rest of Bersatu actually announced that they had a new coalition going. And this new coalition consists of AMNO and PAS, Amno was the previous ruling party. PAS is an Islamic State party, plus Besatu, three core Malay parties, plus a faction of Anwar's party, PKR, which consists of about 11 MPs. Initially, they offered the post of prime ministership again to Mahathe, but Mahathe said no. He refused to have anything to do with this new coalition because he said he doesn't agree with Amno coming into this new coalition. He argues that he is quite willing to work with AMNO, but only with clean people in AMNO. In other words, he claims that if we allow AMNO to come in and join this new coalition, this means that people like Najib and some other AMNO leaders who will be in charge of corruption will get a chance to get back into power again. So anyway, the following Monday, Mahathe resigned, and there was a process during that week where the Malaysian king spoke to all the MPs in the country and also spoke to all the political leaders. On the Thursday of that week, the king announced that he has decided that the person who holds the command, who holds the confidence of the Malaysian parliament was actually Muyadin Yasin, Mahathir's deputy. And a new government was thus formed on the 1st of March, 2020. 
So that's the background to the fall of the Pakatan Harapan government. So what were the three undercurrents that led to the fall of the government? My argument is quite simple, and is that essentially there were three undercurrents that they were not able to deal with. The first is the ideology of Ketuanan Melayu Islam or Malay Islamic supremacy. This is a very, very simple concept to understand. It's been around for a very, very long time. The central theme is that Malaysia belongs to the Malays. And they always remind you that during the colonial era, Malaysia was actually known as Tanah Melayu or Land of the Malays. They also argue that at the time of independence in 1957-63, there was a thing called the social contract. Under the social contract, the leaders, the political leaders of the non-Malay community in Malaysia, and here I'm referring mostly to the Chinese Malaysians and Indian Malaysians, they agree that the Malays will hold political power. In return, AMNO and the other Malay political leaders will give citizenship to the non-Malays. So that is what they call the social contract or the Malaysian version of social contract. They also argue that the Malays are in charge because if you look at the Malaysian constitution under a thing called Article 153, it states very clearly that the Malays and other indigenous people of Malaysia holds a special positions. The side argument, of course, is that it has to be a Malay polity because even before the British and the colonial power came to this part of the world, Tanah Melayu was actually run by Sultanates, Malay Sultanates. And even when the British first came to the region, they accepted that the Sultans were in charge. So from day one, it was understood that Malaysia belonged to the Malays. Now, under the Malaysian system, being counted as a Malay, officially you're categorized as a thing called Bumaputra, which loosely translates to Sons of the Soil. Now, although Bumaputra is a bureaucratic term, in real life, it actually carries a whole host of benefits. If you are classified as a Bumaputra in Malaysia, you get all sorts of benefits. For example, you get easy access to public universities in Malaysia. You get special scholarships. You have special access to special bank loans and business licenses. You also have special rights in terms of getting into the civil service. And interestingly enough, even in the private sector, they recognize these special benefits for the Bumutra. So for example, in Malaysia, if you were to buy a new house in Malaysia, chances are if you are classified as a Bumutra, you get a discount on the price, usually somewhere between 7 to 12%. So this thing is not merely a political level label, it actually comes with a lot of economic benefits. So when AMNO lost power in 2018, they went into a pact with the party Islam to promote the narrative that under the new Pakatan Harapan government, the Malays were losing power. And because they were losing political power, they were losing their special rights and Malay supremacy. Their favorite narrative was that Pakatan Harapan was actually a government controlled by the Chinese DAP party, even though the prime minister was Mahathir. And they claimed that Islam was under threat. So the favorite example they gave to prove that the Malays were losing their political power, the Malay supremacy, and Islam was under threat, was that they argue that you can see that the non-Malays, especially Chinese, are in charge now because non-Malays were appointed as the chief justice, as the attorney general, and as the finance minister. These three positions for the last 40 years has always been held by the Malays or people from UMNO. They also argue that their special rights were under threat because the Pakatan Harapan government was going to sign international convention, such as the International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And they were also planning to sign in the future the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now, the reasons why these two con uh, international conventions are important is because if Malaysia were to sign these two conventions, 
the argument goes that Malaysia will have to get rid of all the special privileges and benefits given to the Bhutra community because you can't practice racial discrimination anymore. Even though if you speak to international lawyers, they said this is actually not true. But anyway, that's the narrative Amno and PAS were using. And that created a lot of fear and anxiety in the Malay population. So for the past two years of the Pakatan Harapan government, you can see this narrative building up very strongly, especially among the rural Malay community, that their special rights and their dominance and their political supremacy and Islam was under threat under this new Chinese controlled government. The second key undercurrents was that you had a really dysfunctional government operating in Malaysia for the last 22 months. You have to remember when these four parties got together to challenge the Barisan National, the previous uh, coalition government, they really had no idea that they were actually gonna win the elections. They thought that they would come close, but they never actually uh, thought that they were actually gonna win government. So when they got into government, essentially each of the four parties did their own thing. There were constant political fights inside and outside the cabinet. So you hear ministers contradicting each other in public. Uh, there was no such thing as collective responsibility. On top of that, a lot of them did not really have experience. As I mentioned, 2018 was the first time you had regime change in Malaysia. And therefore, a lot of the key opposition people who suddenly became cabinet ministers had no experience in ruling or dealing with public administration. In fact, only five out of the 28 cabinet members appointed to the Pakatan Harapan government had any form of government experience. On top of that, you had the civil service who were quietly trying to sabotage all forms of reforms in the Pakatan Harapan government. Uh, the reason why the civil service were highly politicized is because for the past 60 years, AMNO made it a point to only appoint the top layer of the Malaysian civil service based on political loyalty. So when the new Pakatan Harapan government came into power, what they found was that the top layer of civil service, departmental head and above, almost all of them were AMNO appointees and all of them were not very happy that AMNO was no longer in power. In other words, they are all trying to sabotage all the key reforms. And in fact, a lot of them argue that, you know, they should not do anything because there's a chance that AMNO will come back. If they, real, if they were to introduce real reforms and AMNO come back, then their own positions will be under threat. I actually interviewed quite a number of senior civil servants over the past two years. And one of the things that came through very clear in my interviews was that some of the senior servants were also very uncomfortable taking orders from Chinese DAP ministers. Uh, they did not like the way that the the uh, DAP ministers were, were, you know, the way they held the meetings. They thought that this is not the right way of doing things. I'm basically talking about civil service mandarins. These are very, very senior people in the system and they don't like change. Very similar to the top layers of most civil service. They don't like change. And they're very uncomfortable that they're no longer taking leaders uh, orders from Malay political leaders. So one example I always tell people about the lack of, uh, of, of experience is that uh, in the past two years under Pakatan Harapan government, one of the big controversy was that one of the key economic ministers was actually promoting the idea that in terms of technology leap, Malaysia should devote a lot of its resources into trying to create a flying car. So this is an example of when I talk about lack of experience. Now, the third key undercurrent that I'm arguing on why the government fell is Mahathir himself was actually behind the fall of the Pakatan Harapan government. To understand why this is the reason, you need to understand that by mid-2019, in other words, one year after Pakatan Harapan got into government, Mahathir was already looking for a new political model. He was very worried that Bersatu being the third smallest party in the Pakatan Harapan government was constantly being bullied by DAP and PKR and thus reinforcing this public perception that the Chinese are in charge. 
Now, the reason why he had to be worried was because he was worried that come the next general election, GE15, Bersatu will be wiped out in the Malay areas, especially with the narrative getting hold in the rural areas. This narrative being that the Malays are losing power. If this narrative were to, were to keep going on until the next general election, which is due in 2023, then Bersatu will be totally wiped out and his own party, Bersatu, will be the key casualty. Now, in terms of Mahathir, he's also worried about something, uh, about his own personal political interests as well. He has been trying to build up the political career of his son, Mukris Mahathir, and he was worried that if Bersatu is wiped out, this not only end his own political career, but it will also end the political career of his son, Mukris Mahathir. We understand from some of his closest friends that he was also worried about the way the government uh, was heading. He didn't like a lot of the cabinet fights. He felt that the Chinese DAP was also challenging him on too many of the policies. So basically, his idea of a new political model was that we want to make this a more Malay-centric government by bringing in more and more defections. And here, when I talk about defections, I'm talking about MPs primarily from AMNO the party that he was president for more than 23 years. So the idea was that he will bring in individual MPs for AMNO to boost the number of Bersatu so that by the time he leaves Bersatu, say next year or the year after that, Bersatu will be one of the largest party in the Pakatan Harapan government. Now, of course, this did not happen because everything imploded in February. But his long-term plans will be, was basically to have a lot of defections for AMNO Bersatu becomes the largest party or at least the second largest party in the coalition so that when he leaves the political scene, his son will be protected and the prime ministership will still be in the hands of Bersatu. The other major reason why he's responsible for the fall of the government was, remember I mentioned that the government imploded on a Friday night? The following Monday, he actually went to see the king and he told the king that he will resign as the prime minister. On the same day, the king appointed him as the caretaker prime minister. Now, this was a major political mistake because he was under no threat. In other words, he did not have to resign. If he had not resigned on that Monday, there would not have been a vacancy for a new prime minister. And therefore, Muyading, his deputy, would not have gotten the chance to be the new prime minister and depose him. So where are we now? So now we have a new government called Perikatan National or the National Alliance. Basically consisting of three parties and they're all Malay based parties. The first one is AMNO, United Malays National Organization, which essentially stands for Malay nationalism. And this was the party that ruled Malaysia from 1957 until 2018. The second party is Party Islam Malaysia, they stand for Islam and the creation of an Islamic state in Malaysia. The third one is Basatu, which is Mahathir's party, which also stands for Malay nationalism. So the best way of understanding Basatu is that Basatu is actually a splinter party for AMNO, consisting of all those people who were against Najib Razak, the previous prime minister, and Mahathir supporters. So if you look at it, Basically, the new government consists of three Malay-based party without any real participation from the non-Malay population in Malaysia. And the non-Malay population in Malaysia is around 34-35% of the whole population. So this government is basically a Malay-first policy government. So the bottom line is that basically the implosion of the Pakatan Harapan government and the creation of government means that the Malays are not ready to share power with the non-Malay simulation. So where do we go from here? I think if you step back and look at it from a wider angle, you'll find that what is happening in Malaysia is really not unique. You'll find very strong parallels between what happened in Malaysia and the Pacific Islands of Fiji. In Fiji, you also had a very strong ideology called the Tauke ideology, which is very similar to the Malay supremacy ideology. 
In other words, this ideology is based on a very simple premise that the original indigenous people must always hold political power. So if you look at the first two coup by Rambuka in 1987 in Fiji, part of his rationale for organizing the coup was that he wanted the Fijians to retain political control. And a major portion of his support or his political base was actually from the Tauke movement. And as I mentioned earlier, the ideology is very similar to the Malay supremacy, except it's Fijian supremacy. The other thing that's very clear from the recent February regime change in Malaysia is that despite globalization, identity, politics, ethnicity, and religion are still very, very powerful motivations in many parts of the world, especially in the developing world. We like to think that with globalization, in terms of political norms, people are moving towards democracy. But in many parts of the world, it's actually not true. And what happened in Malaysia is a clear example of that. Now, in terms of Australia-Malaysia ties, I would argue that uh, there's no change. Uh, Australians have always understood about uh, Malay supremacy uh, as a key item in Malaysian politics. They've always worked very well with the Malaysian government under AMNO for the last 60 years. Uh, they've worked reasonably well with uh, the Pakatan Harapan government. So in terms of australia Malaysian ties, I don't see any real changes. It will just carry on as usual. But what is happening in Malaysia now, the best way to understand it is that what we're seeing is a process of bringing the country back to pre-2018. In other words, all the policies that are being pursued by the Perikatan National Government is basically the same policy pursued by AMNO. In other words, they're trying to bring or, or reverse all the reforms made by the Pakatan Harapan government and bring the country back to pre-2018. So it's as if the last 22 months did not happen. In other words, from 2018 to 2020, the whole period is sort of, they just want to erase it completely. So I have always argued that since February this year, we have business as usual in Malaysia. Business as usual as in pre-2018 business as usual. And in fact, I would argue that many foreign countries and foreign companies are actually very comfortable with this model. Because like I mentioned, AMNO has been powerful for more than 60 years. They know AMNO, they know the way things are done in Malaysia. So they're very comfortable with the old model. So what's going to happen in the immediate future? So in the immediate future, now that Mahathe is out of power, he's becoming a more and more bitter old man. He's campaigning to bring Nam Muyeding, his successor, and he wants to become prime minister again. Now, what is remarkable is that if he succeeds, he'll be prime minister for the third time. And if he succeeds this year, he'll be 95 years old. But what is incredible is that if you speak to people in Malaysia, nobody talks about it. So age is no longer a factor in Malaysia. In fact, most people expect him to hang around for at least a good, another good 10 years. The other person who's campaigning with prime minister is of course, Anwar Ibrahim. Anwar Ibrahim was also very bitter about the whole thing because he felt that he was being let down by Mahathe. As I mentioned in 2018, there was a political deal where Mahathe was supposed to serve for two years and he was supposed to hand power to Anwar Ibrahim in May this year. Of course, that didn't happen because the government collapsed in February. So now Anwar is saying that I will no longer support Mahathe even if he succeeds in bring Namu Yeding, I want to be prime minister. But what is also very clear that because of the sudden change in government, we actually have a very unstable situation in Malaysia right now because we don't have a very clear sense of what the numbers are like for both sides, for both the government and the opposition. What we do know is that either side, either the Pakatan Harapan side or the Perikatan side, if they do have the numbers, they have a very, very small majority. In Malaysia, if you want a government, you need to have a minimum of 113 MPs. Most people in Malaysia will tell you that if a vote is taken on the floor of parliament, whichever side wins, they will be winning somewhere around 116, 117, so a very, very small majority. Now, the reasons why we don't have any clear numbers is because parliament has essentially been suspended because of the COVID-19 crisis. So in some ways, Muyeding is very, very lucky. 
he staged an internal coup at the end of February, just at the start of the lockdown. And because of the lockdown, there's no parliament, so nobody can scrutinize him. So the next big battle will be when parliament reconvenes on the 13th of July. And Mahathir is already saying that he'll try to move a motion of non-confidence against Moyedin on the 13th of July. My own take is that that probably will not happen uh, for all sorts of reasons. But the main reasons why that vote of non-confidence will not happen is because the way it works in the Malaysian parliament is that government business comes first. So the government will stack, will make sure that uh, his vote of non-confidence will not make it to the, the papers. And they'll probably pass a vote of confidence among themselves even before the vote of non-confidence is applied. So quickly, I'll come to the conclusion. The positive thing about the regime change in February is that obviously now Malaysians are used to the idea that you can have a change of government and you don't have rioting in the streets. For a very long time in Malaysia, people worry about the fall of governments because in 1969, there was racial rioting in Malaysia between the Malays and the Chinese community. And for a very long time, it was understood that if the unknown government falls on power, you'll get racial rights and the whole country will be shut down. So now we had two regime change in Malaysia, nothing happens. So people are used to a change of government and that's always a good thing. But I think if you look at it rationally, there are more negatives. The negative of course is this, you have a Malay centric government, but you, have a, you don't have any participation from non-Malay community, which make up one third of the population. And it is my argument that because of this strong Malay supremacy ideology, a genuine Western style democracy is not possible for the foreseeable future. I think the other negative point is that with Party Islam Malaysia now part of the federal government, we can see a greater push towards Islamization in Malaysia. The other really negative thing is, of course, many of the senior AMNO politicians who are charged for corruption under regime change, it's very likely that most of them will get away with it now because AMNO is part of the ruling coalition. And of course, the two other major points that we can expect more brain drain, especially among the non-Malays. Most of them, because of the recent regime change, may be thinking that there's no future for me in Malaysia with a Malay-centric government. So it's better for me to seek my living elsewhere or outside Malaysia. And of course, we know that those people who can move easily tend to be the people who are the most educated ones with the most talented ones. And of course, don't forget East Malaysia consists, uh, sorry, Malaysia consists of two parts. You got Malay Peninsula and the states of Sabah and Sarawak on the island of Borneo. And the indigenous people in Borneo who are not Malays, they are totally cut out of the new political system and they'll be marginalized further. So I thought I'll end up showing pictures of the three key players. The first one is of course Mahathir, and he's made the argument that age is really just a number. The one in the middle is Anwar Ibrahim, and he understands clearly that this is his last chance to be prime minister. Uh, this long standing joke in Malaysia is that Anwar has been waiting to be prime minister since 1990. And of course, the one on the right is Moyadin Yassin. And he must be quite happy now because he managed to dislodge the two most powerful politicians in Malaysia and end up being the Prime Minister of Malaysia. And of course, the other big winner in this whole saga is Najib Razak, the, uh, the UMNO leader who was deposed in the 2018 elections. And in fact, this picture is taken from his Twitter feed. He sent out this picture the day that Mahathir was sacked from the Bersatu party. So obviously he's quite happy now that he's gonna get away. Very likely he'll get away from the MD, one MDB corruption scandal. And that when this government is stabilized, he'll probably come back holding a senior position. Now, if you're interested in what I've, I've, uh, what I've given this afternoon, I've actually published a journal article about this whole thing. And it was just published. It just came out this month uh, in this journal called The Round Table, the Commonwealth Journal of International Affairs. And you can access this journal easily. If you have a UTAS email, you should be able to access uh, this journal by clicking on the link there under the DOI. It will bring you to the library website and you should be able to download this article. So that's all. Thank you very much, Kim.
Thanks, James. Um, can you stop sharing your screen now? So yes. this is the yeah, I'm trying to do that now. Thank you. So while James is sharing, thank you. Um, I want to remind people that this event has been um, uh, recorded and will be available on both the university's YouTube and the um, AIIA's YouTube as well, so people can catch up later. Can I, um, as chair, have the uh, first question? James, you said that um, the regime change has not um, made a major impact on most of Malaysia's relationships with other countries like Australia. What about the relationship with, with China? Uh, no, um, you have to remember one of, the, one of the key lessons we've learned about the way the Chinese conduct their affairs in Southeast Asia is that They've always seen countries in Southeast Asia as part of the backyard, the way America sees Central America, that's number one. Secondly, the Chinese conduct their foreign policy over the long term. So a small hiccup like regime change over a process, over a period of two years, it has no meaning to them. What they really want is to make sure that Southeast Asia is under their control, either directly or indirectly, and they want to control these countries over the long term. So this sort of regime change, they're not really worried about it. Right now, um, my take is that the Chinese are more worried about what's happening in the South China Sea than things like uh, what's happening in Malaysia. Thanks, James. I'll get to um, as many of the audience questions as we can manage. Um, so the first one is from um, uh, is, is a question about um, in a country where nearly all of the uh, MPs and more recently the PAS MPs go into politics as a quick and easy way to get rich rather than in, in terms of nation building, um, what are the chances of the PNBN, PAS grouping to be eliminated from such important public offices? Uh, it's not possible. As I mentioned, the current uh, coalition consists of three major parties, AMNO, PAS and Besatu. AMNO and PAS are actually working very, very closely together. And in terms of the number of MPs versus Besatu's MPs, it's something like three to one. So it is not possible to remove AMNO and PAS from power. Uh, it's likely that we'll see uh, AMNO and PAS will remain power even if the current government falls uh, because AMNO and PAS basically control the entire Malay vote in the rural areas. So there's no way to get rid of them. Okay. Um, the next question was about, um, by definition, Malaysia is actually an apartheid country. Um, would you agree with that? And if you would, why um, hasn't there been action or reaction from the international community? Um, I wouldn't go so far to call Malaysia an apartheid country. I think the way to understand it is that um, Malay supremacy works on the premise that the Malays must be number one in all fields. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they, they don't allow the Chinese to come up. It's just that the Chinese cannot hold the key positions in politics. Uh, in the economic arena, uh, the Chinese are quite free to become multi-millionaires, but it's just that they're not given a space in the political arena. Uh, it's unlike South Africa apartheid system where the, uh, the indigenous black population is cut off both from the economy and from politics. In Malaysia, it's, it's, it's different. It's more on the political and religious side, uh, dominance of supremacy, and the Chinese are given more or less a free hand in the economy. Thanks, James. Um, another question along a similar line. Um, do you think that the ethnic divisions in Malaysia are stronger now than they'd ever been? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, because of this uh, Bumutra policy, a lot of the non malays in Malaysia feels that, especially for the children, they feel that there's no opportunities for the children. Uh, so that's the reason why we see a lot of brain drain among the talented non malays especially the Chinese and Indian population. So countries like Australia, New Zealand, UK have always benefited from, from this brain drain. I mean, it's a well-known fact that the thousands of Malaysian students who study in Australian universities as fee-paying international students, after they finish their studies in Australia, most of them will try to stay on in Australia rather than bringing back their education and their skills back to Malaysia. Okay, um, 
One question is about the political aspirations of, I think, Mahatia's daughter. Is there a daughter that, with political aspirations? Yes, one of the really interesting things about Malaysia is that uh, most people will probably agree with me that uh, Anwar's daughter called Nuru Iza and Mahathir's daughter called Marina, uh, these two ladies probably have a, a better, better political instinct than their male counterparts. Uh, but because the system is based on, on, on male dominance, it's very difficult for them to, to uh, get up the political ladder. Uh, if you were to ask me to bet who is likely to reach the top of the political ladder in the future, it's probably Nuru Iza, Anwar Ibrahim's daughter, rather than Marina Mahate. Marina Mahate for the last 20 years has devoted most of her time to the NGO work. Uh, some of it, a lot of it has got to do with uh, Islamic gender issues. Uh, so far, although she's very interested in political issues, she has not stepped into the political arena. Uh, Nuru Iza is actually widely seen as the political heir to Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, in fact, she's currently MP and she's been MP for three terms already. Okay. Um, and a next question. What's, what do you think is Anwar's political future now? Uh, that is a really, really good question. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Anwar is seen as the Prime Minister and waiting for the last 20 years. So I think most people uh, will tell you in Kuala Lumpur that uh, this is the last chance for Anwar to be the prime minister. So if there's going to be another round of fallout, this will be Anwar's last chance to push and become the prime minister. Uh, if we head towards the next general election, if Anwar is to be the prime ministerial candidate for Pakatan Harapan and Pakatan Harapan loses the election, I think that will be the final nail in his political coffin. I don't think he'll be able to make a comeback after the next general election. Okay, that leads on to the next question about, there's talk about a snap election in Malaysia now to end the political instability. Um, do you think um, PN will ret retain power if this happens? Um, if a, sure, if a snap election were to be held in Malaysia, um, my instinct tells me that uh, Whichever side wins, they win with a very small majority, like a majority of five or six seats. Because I think uh, going around the country is quite clear that the voters are split along ethnic lines. So I think it will the results will probably be split as well. So I suspect uh, most of the urban and semi-urban areas will go to the opposition. The rural areas will go with the current government, the Malay centric government. So again, we will have a very uh, split results. Okay, and that leads us on to the next question about the, um, the role of the king. Um, I, I suspect that, that, that um, people didn't know much about the role of the king. And do you think that, so can you talk about that in general, but also whether the king exceeded his authority in the last change? Uh, not really. Um, Malaysia adopted basically the British uh, Westminster system. So essentially what happens is that uh, when the government imploded, uh, the king had to step in and, and it's actually in the constitution that the king can appoint a prime minister who in his, uh, in his who he thinks has the confidence of the parliament. So in this case, he chose Mo Yeding and he thinks that Mo Yeding has the confidence of the MPs or the majority of MPs in the Malaysian parliament. So he is within his constitutional right to appoint Mo Yeding as the prime minister. Uh, the reason why there was a lot of controversy is because uh, 24 hours before Muyeding was formally appointed the Prime Minister of Malaysia on the 1st of March, Mahathir held a press conference and in that press conference, he said that the king refuses to see him, even though he says that he wants to go and see the king to show the king that he has the majority, not Muyeding. So that's the reason why there's a lot of controversy. But strictly speaking, uh, the king has the constitutional power to appoint anybody he thinks uh, commands the confidence of parliament. So in this case, he chose Mo Yeding. Thanks, James. Um, so um, with the current ideology, do you think that corruption will ever end or be managed more appropriately in Malaysia? Um, that's a really, really good question. Um, my view is very different from most people. 
because uh, I take the view that in many parts of the developing world, uh, what is understood as corruption in the West is the cost of doing business in those parts of the world. So in Malaysia, uh, corruption is seen as the cost of doing business rather than, than, than a problem, an issue of poor governance. So um, if you look at it from that perspective, there will, there will always be corruption in Malaysia. Uh, the question is, uh, what sort of level? I think under the previous regime, under the UMNO regime, corruption was quite serious. It went to, to, to the very top of the political tree. And I think you did not find that under the Pakatan Harapan government. Uh, corruption was more uh, at a lower level rather at a very high level. I think when people talk about uh, ongoing corruptions in Malaysia, they worry that if we go back to the old regime, the old UMNO regime, corruption will reach to the very, very high level. Okay. Um, can you talk about the, the, the rights and well-being and safety of the non Puma Petra people in the future? Um, in terms of uh, physical threats, there are no physical threats against the non Bumatra or the non Malays in Malaysia. Uh, what we're really essentially talking about are political rights. In other words, uh, the non Bumatra in Malaysia, the non Malays, I will never be treated as equal citizens by the Malay community. And that's the reason why I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the Malay community as a whole uh, do not believe in uh, granting the non-Malays equal political rights because they subscribe to this ideology of uh, Malay political supremacy. So uh, they, are, they are not under any fiscal threats. It's just that they will not be able to enjoy full citizenship rights. Uh, they'll basically be treated as second-class citizens under the present political ideology. Okay, um, so a, a sort of follow-up question to that, but are there any concerns expressed about the increased risk of human rights violations against amongst non-Malays? Uh, yes, but uh, the attacks, especially in terms of human rights abuse against the non-Malays, uh, is not really targeted at the non-Malays. The sort of human rights abuse that we're talking about is basically against the opponents of the government. So right now, the government is cracking down very strongly on the freedom of speech. Uh, they've gone after independent news website and after individuals for postings on Facebook and social media. Uh, they're charging them in court. So the, it's, it's really about controlling the narrative because as I mentioned, uh, there's a general election coming up in two years time and this government is quite shaky. So it's more about controlling the population, controlling the opposition rather than targeting the non malays Thank you. Um, going back to my original question about China, um, there's another question from the audience about, is Malaysia still involved in the, any China Belt and Road initiatives or have they withdrawn due to other financial commitments? Uh, no, uh, Malaysia is still, uh, is still a firm supporter of the, of the BRI. Uh, the reason why a lot of people are confused about Malaysia's uh, position BRI is because when the new government took over in 2018, uh, what they found was that a lot of the BRI projects in Malaysia were actually uh, uh, ma in corruption. Uh, most of them were overpriced, so Mahathir had to negotiate with the Chinese leadership uh, in Beijing, and, and in all the key projects, basically he received uh, one third discount on, on the cost of the projects. And uh, since then, we know that some of the key projects. Uh, a lot of money were actually siphoned off by, by unknown people. Uh, so this way we will come back to the issue about the cost of doing business. But coming back to your question, uh, Malaysia uh, has more or less signed up to the BRI because uh, they understand that the future economic prosperity will depend on China. So in some ways, they really don't have a choice. It's more issue of cost and who benefits from all these ongoing projects. How do you divide up the benefits of BRI projects? rather than whether you will take part in the BRI. So irrespective of how this proceeds in terms of the current regime change in any future government, you don't anticipate any changes with the China BRI? No, and I think uh, this is true for most countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, people understand that uh, China has a, has a big presence in Southeast Asia. There's really no way to run away from the Chinese shadow. So it's a question of dealing with uh, China rather than confronting China. Okay, thank you. Um, going back to the, if you like, the personal, 
Um, what about the political career of Najib? You mentioned him in the beginning, but do you think he is going to return or do you think he'll sit eating his chips forever? Uh, no. Uh, I mentioned in my seminar that it looks very likely that he'll get away with uh, all the charges relating to 1MDB uh, sooner or later. Uh, just a side note, uh, he may be found guilty in one of the charges, uh, but don't take that too seriously because you know, right, in the, in the, in the uh, English system, right, you're not really found guilty because there are also appeals built into the system. A lot of these uh, guilty charges can be reversed at the appeal stage. So basically, my take is that uh, as long as Amno is in power at the federal level, he still has a political career and it is possible for him to come back in the future once he deposed of all the trials relating to 1MDB and other uh, corruption charges. So the $24,000 question, um, based on the current balance of power, who's got the better chance of winning of the three faces that you put up? Or is there another face that you didn't put up? Oh, you mean if it was that general election would be yeah. held? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The short answer is I don't know. I, I, I need to to talk to the uh, old ladies in the kampongs and <laughs> the rural mm -hmm. voters before I can give you a definite answer on that, on that question. Okay. Um, your com observation about a brain drain was also supported by the Fijian experience. Um, since the coups there, ethnic Indians have emigrated in large numbers, ensuring the political dominance of the ethnic Fijians and easing political tensions. But um, as the questioner points out, the um, COVID-19 pandemic has actually frozen immigration programs to countries like Australia, the UK, United States. Is that a potential political safety valve for, Malaysian, for Malaysia? And what, how will the non-Malays express themselves politically? Uh, no, it's not really a safety valve. Uh, when people plan to move or to immigrate, uh, they see the COVID-19 as simply a pause. Uh, in fact, you give them more time to put the assets together, to sell the assets and get ready to, to immigrate overseas. So it's, it's not really, uh, the COVID-19 will have no impact on immigration. Uh, it's, it's widely understood that once the COVID-19 crisis is over, uh, most Western countries were still taking immigrants. You have to remember, when we talk about these immigrants, we're not talking about uh, the people uh, from Central America heading towards America. We're talking about highly skilled people these are people with tertiary educations, a lot of uh, extensive work experience. They usually have capital. So uh, countries taking these sort of people in, uh, basically they're taking in talent. So there's very little risk. So uh, you know, so I don't, I don't doubt that they will eventually move out of Malaysia. Okay. Um, one of the other questions is again about Chinese, but basically it's about uh, the question says. Wealthy Chinese business people have been a feature of Malaysia for many years. Somehow they've managed to do well under a range of governments. Um, do you see the current government or any potential change of government as different? And if so, what's, how's it affecting the Chinese business people in Malaysia on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, no, like, so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Chinese have always understood that because they don't have any space in terms of the political arena, they've concentrated all their resources in the business. Um, one of the really, really interesting things about, I mean, we spoke about discrimination in Malaysia, right? One of the really interesting things was that when they brought in the new economic policy, the policy that actively discriminate against the Chinese and Indians, uh, after a while, uh, what, what they discovered was that one of the biggest supporters of this policy was actually the Chinese tycoons. Now, you may ask me, how is that possible? Don't they feel that they're being discriminated? And the answer is very simple, right? So in Malaysia, the way it works is that under government procurement system, all the big projects, you can only award the projects to uh, Malay businessmen. So what these Chinese businessmen do is that uh, they have uh, a secret uh, uh, shareholdings with these Malay businessmen. The Malay businessmen will bid for these government contracts or government projects. Once they get the projects, they'll pass it on to the Chinese partners. So the way the Chinese businessmen look at this issue is actually quite simple. If it was a free for all, a free market, then the chances of me getting the project or the contract is virtually zero. But because they have this policy where they actively 
discriminate in favor of the Malays, I just have to work with the most powerful Malay politician to get these contracts. And in fact, it's actually better for me because the because the contracts are awarded on political ground, I can actually increase the price of the contract. So both sides wins. The Malay partner wins because he made millions of dollars by just grabbing the contract, a piece of paper. And the Chinese partner wins as well because he gets to do the job. So in some ways, you know, when it comes to things like discrimination, uh, the irony is that, you know, you'll be surprised. Uh, there are pockets of non-Malay uh, people, especially the big businessmen, who actually support this racial discriminatory policies in Malaysia. That's fascinating, James. Um, I think we, I haven't been able to manage all the questions, but one last one, which is slightly a different tack, is what sorts of change will um, this, what will the changes mean for the relationship between Malaysia and the Middle East? Right. So the leader of Party Islam Malaysia, a guy called Hadi Awan, He's been appointed a special envoy to the Middle East. Uh, in the Malaysian system, a special envoy is a person with ministerial rank. So he's been going to the Middle East and basically selling the idea that the Malaysian government is now basically a halal or Islamic government. So he's trying to uh, expand the support for his party. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, I expect uh, Party Islam Malaysia to push for more Islamization in Malaysia. Uh, I, th I think that will lead to a uh, uh, worsening of relations between the Muslim and the non-Muslim population in Malaysia. Oh, sorry, coming back to the Middle East, right. Um, th there'll be no major impact in the Middle East because uh, many of the Middle East countries uh, have never really regarded Malaysia as a key player. Uh, they've regarded Malta as a key player, but in the last 10 years, when they look towards Southeast Asia, the key country they look at is actually Indonesia, not Malaysia. James, thank you. That was um, a fascinating webinar that went extremely quickly and um, you did a wonderful job in answering it. So uh, thanks to everyone for attending and um, please keep a look out for future um, AIIA and uh, University of Tasmania events in the um, discussion. Our next joint event is a, is a special one. It's uh, with um, Chris Patton, known as the last governor of Hong Kong, and Gareth Evans in conversation. That's on the 15th of July. So I hope you can join us then. And again, James, thank you. That was a great seminar. We had um, at one stage 140 attendees, and I think that's a terrific um, boost to uh, to the university's discussions and also a recognition of your skills in this area. So thank you very much. Thank you.